Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to <laughs> to Suze Labs and my talk about security theater. Um, a praise of folly for those who have not talked about or talked with me about this topic in the last month because I've, I've been doing this talk quite some quite several times, but it's getting adapted and uh, updated every time I do it. And it's about the mostly unknown OSI layer, OSI layer 8 and above. And uh, it's a not so much technical talk and I hope it's a little bit of fun to you also. Okay, anybody knows Erasmus of Rotterdam, The Praise of Folly? Any, has anybody heard of that? Um, he was a philosopher, author in the early 16th century, long time ago, and he described the whole world or he he builds this this idea of the whole world as a theater where we are just where the mortals are just actors on the stage, and uh, somebody is the director and whatever very religious person, and but I like I liked his writings especially because of sentences like the one that I've got in bold here. Um, if you tell people that it's a stage and the theater, then they will use brickbats to to throw you out of the theater because. Uh, they don't like you. they don't like being told about that sometimes, but sometimes people are on the stage and they come in on the stage and they come back in different disguises, playing other persons, other roles, and um, but we have that in many ways in our world. We also have it in IT security or in <coughs> sorry in uh, in science. Anyhow, this is one of my. Idols, you may know him, uh, Richard Feynman, and uh, he's he's he coined the term cargo cult, cargo cult science, cargo cult security, cargo cult programming, and that is another meme that I want to 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 explain to you in the course of this talk. It's about when people just stick to rules and uh, mechanisms and rituals that literally don't make sense just because they want to believe it. And this is, for me, this is a little bit connected to the theater thing because if you tell people too much or if you tell them the truth, sometimes they, the messenger will be the one that is to blame for when something goes wrong. And cargo cult programming, cargo cult science, yeah. I've put the links in this presentation and I think there's quite a lot of good reads here. So there's a lot of links and a lot of information. That's just normal with my presentation. So if you feel like any time interrupt me, I've got a Q&A at the end, but there's a lot of information. So here we go. Another principle, have you ever heard of that? Polar, the principle of least astonishment. That's something that you should follow in programming and coding, also in security. And uh, the design should match the user's experience, expectations and mental models. Like the Windows firewall, you may have noticed, yeah? The, the door is safe, is safe. Or this is how a bug passes QA testing. <laughs> and if you, if you code software, um, I think many of us often forget the user and what the user might try. <laughs> and it's hard to imagine uh, the ways users might want to use the software that you code. <laughs> yeah? So I think it's impossible to get the full scope. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And this is also one thing I like because this is, uh, we, we, at SUSE, we've got the topic of full stack. <laughs> Yeah? You've got two items that work perfectly if you don't combine them. <laughs> the ball, the basketball works perfectly and the bottle will work perfectly, but don't, don't, don't combine them. And that's, okay, again, the, that's what comes out when you've got unit tests and two unit tests but no integration tests. But that's just for the start. That's, and these things, that's even more important when it comes to security. But what is security? And I did a lot of well research on that also, and you always come back to the to the honorable Bruce Schneier. And he pins it down to the feeling secure. And you there is no way of 
of uh, defining it in any way better then it's about the feeling. You can feel secure. There's basically two situations. You can feel secure, but you aren't, or in other or bad situations, yeah? Uh, and in other bad situations, you may feel insecure, but you're totally secure. And uh, as I said before, that was sort of like an introduction. This presentation is meant to be understandable. Please don't lynch me for brevity and maybe some wrong technical explanations. I want to have this understandable also for children and managers, and that's also a quote from a book that I will show you later. So, this is the agenda. After some maybe funny openers, I will introduce me in short words, then give you some definitions of security and security theater, followed by a technical explanation of the OSI layers and the main actors and plots, and the second half will be full of examples, analysis, and suggestions. Basically, the List of examples will be where I can cut down and go faster because you can have a look at them in the slides, depending on the time as I progress. So, who am I? Yeah, I'm somebody who li always likes to deal with danger, obviously. I'm Markus Fahne, I'm the team lead of documentation at SUSE. Most of you know me, and uh, my people. Or with my team, the, the great people in my team, they are writing the handbooks, the, the manuals for the, uh, for the software, for the great software that you produce. I've always liked dealing with danger, obviously. This is, this is me in the 80s uh, on top of Mount Stromboli, sleeping there. You can see my sleeping bag on the floor. Or I also like traveling and sleeping outside in Serengeti. <laughs> and uh, this is, the, the, that's a picture that people from my team post in social media and say, this is my boss. <laughs> okay, I have studied geography. I've started working with Linux in 1994. I've started my own business. I've had my own employees since the year 2000. And I was a journalist. I wrote some books. And since 2015, I'm at SUSE. And this is the first official job as a people manager. I love traveling and doing weird things. Yeah. And uh, as Linus Torvalds, he has his father, and this is the island where, they, where he probably is going to retreat again soon, said, I did it, I also did it all just for fun, and that's the most important thing to me, and I guess that's also, the quote from him is also true for programmers in labs, I guess. Yeah, with my own company, I learned a lot about marketing, money, taxes, project management, and customers, so this was my first office, my first project management um, whiteboard and uh, a full featured server room with uh, AC. As an enterprise consultant, I learned to sit between chairs and to understand needs that were very, very different, like um, my boss wanted to sell as many hours of, as a, of me as a consultant to the customer and thus he preferred a solution that would make a lot of money for the company. The customer wanted to save money and I was in the middle because I had, I probably knew what would have been the best technical solution, which wasn't either one. And so that gave me, that's where I got uh, the position between technical needs and enterprise needs. And I think that's, yeah, that's where I learned to sit between the chairs. Later, I was writing, authoring stuff for Linux Magazine. And I was, I, something like a red thread through my, through my business life was connecting the two worlds, technical and enterprise. Good. You still, would you feel safe in this place? It reminded me, it's in Utah. It's in uh, Little Sahara, it's a lesser known uh, national park, natural park. And I felt like, in, I, I was driving there and it felt like Simpsons somehow. <laughs> so let's define security. That's also why I asked, do you feel secure? And it's just the number that makes a change whether you feel secure in this picture. Yeah? If, there's, if there would have been 400 days since the last accident, you would feel secure. Yeah? So it's always, as Schneier said, the, the, the feeling versus the reality. And it depends on the models. So the model of reality and your feelings. 
Um, the Another approach is defining security is not about feelings, it's about time-based security. And this is a book from the 80s that I really, really like and I still think is very good. It's time-based security and basically it says you have a certain time interval in which you can be secure and you have always, <coughs> um, sorry, you can, you can only be secure within this certain interval and you're ahead of your attackers and it's only a question of time and after a certain time you will not be secure anymore. For example, the keys and the stuff that you use, the RSA keys or whatever we, that we used 10 years ago, they cannot be considered secured anymore, uh, secure anymore today. And so, yeah, let's not talk about the, the um, vast amount of kernel one dot something IoT systems that are out in the wild. And it's a, it's a question of time. And the stuff that we're using today will not be secure anymore in 10 years from now. It's all just secure for a certain interval of time. Then we have the, the question of control and transparency where open source comes in versus um, um, the, the topic of, uh, how to say, um, oh, come on, sorry, um, obscurity, yes. Transparency versus obscurity. And that's also one part of a definition because without open source, there is no security. There can be, uh, there can be, um, it's essential to look into it, but I'm not, I don't need to tell that to you. And here we got this security versus trust, also known as security by obscurity. If, I mean, to this audience, I don't need to explain that, but if you, you can trust a big company that has closed source, but you cannot really look into it, so you have to trust. It's not real security, it's trust. And uh, another book that I'd like to recommend is um, Buddha's Brain, and that's about uh, many, many topics, but among them one topic, why we have such huge problems when it comes to assessing dangers. And that is, a lot of that is based on evolution and on our tribal roots. I will talk about that later a little bit when I come to bias. So, I looked up security in, I think it's Webster's Oxford, Dic Oxford Dictionary, and you can see that security definitions have, has the word, okay, the definition of security has different aspects. It's the state of being free from danger or threat, or the safety of a state organization, or its procedures followed, or the state of feeling safe. So again, here we have the feeling inside, yeah? And I defined it in 2003 when I wrote my first uh, yeah, handbook, book, book, uh, training book about security, about firewalls. It's the good feeling an administrator has in the evening when he leaves work, knowing he has done all he can to protect the services, machines, and colleagues. I think that's still quite viable. At least nobody has hmm, bitched me for that. <laughs> and security theater is just a mock-up of it. And most of you will have heard of the term after September 11 and the TSA, uh, airport, security checks. And uh, that's when re researchers started calling it security theater. And I don't know if you heard the story of the TSA locks. These are the locks that you have on, on your keys, uh, on your keys, on your suitcases. <laughs> These are the keys or the locks for the suitcases. And TSA, the, the airport security, for example, they're supposed to have a master key. And that was the first time where the whole world was shown why a, a master key is not, a, or why a lock with a master key is not a secure lock. What happened to TSA keys was that, um, which was it? Yeah, the Washington Post wrote an article, or published an article about this system, and they put a high resolution picture of, this, of the master key in the article. <laughs> in I think it was in 2014 or something like that. And then somebody 3D printed the master key from the picture and it worked. And so that's a wonderful example for security theater, but all the people believe in it and you can still buy suitcases. And every shop assistant, 
knows it. They just don't tell you. They still sell it to you as safe, as secure. And that is our human nature that plays with this. We want to feel secure. And that sometimes is more important than the reality. So, um, again, here is where um, Erasmus of Rotterdam comes in. It goes so far that if somebody uncovers the theater, I'm sorry, I'm doing that maybe right now, not to this audience, but to other audiences maybe. If someone uncovers that, the feeling secure is gone instantly. It's like quantum entanglement. Yeah, it's just poof. So uh, if you haven't heard that TSA lock story again, you may think different of your suitcase now, maybe. <laughs> but you can order these TSA master keys on the internet for one, two, three dollars or so. Um, when we're talking of corporate IT or company IT, um, we have uh, some concepts that come to the rescue. For example, I coined the, the term blameware because of some German state administrations switching back to Windows, who had had Linux before. Das Auswärtige Amt, so that's part of the organization of the embassies. And uh, blameware is software that a company uses or buys so that they don't have the blame anymore if something goes wrong. That's, that's a very common thing. You buy stuff from IBM, you buy stuff from Microsoft or whoever, um, because you won't get fired because of that. That's an old saying from the 80s. That is basically blameware. And uh, it's, it doesn't matter if you can win in court against them if they do something wrong. That doesn't matter, but the blame is outside of the company, so you don't lose your job if something goes wrong. And that was the article I wrote in, oh my god, 2011. <laughs> so it, that is when I understood that there is some layers on top of our OSI model that we have. So I guess all of you are familiar with this. And this is not from me, the whole model is not from me, this is from Wikipedia, uh, and I guess you all know the first seven layers. You should, at least, if you're in, in IT, in a technical job. And there's three new layers on top of that. I will explain them on the next slide. So, the OSI layers, th from one through eight are, from one through seven are technical. Ah, that's a misspelling, from one to seven are technical. So this is the and sort of like the networking model. Incoming data travels from, travels upwards, outgoing travel, travel, out, sorry, outgoing traffic travels downwards. So usually we only have seven layers, so the data arrives at the physical layer, goes data link, network, transport session, presentation to the application layer which is like the, yeah, this is the press, the services layer, which gets, is what you see on the screen. But then we have the problem that is sitting in front of the screen, and that is the OSI level, layer eight. And um, that's the user. It's not always the problem, of course, but sometimes it may be the problem. And this user, but it's, not, it's still not the top of the model, because this user is integrated into organizations that make him do things that are the reason for his actions. And the, there's discussion going on about OZ layer 9 and 10, which one is more important. Um, I would say OZ layer 9 is um, organization, like the corporation, the company you're involved in, or the state. And la layer 10 is politics, like government. Some people have asked questions if layers nine and 10 are already something like analog artificial intelligence because they behave, they seem to behave, uh, or they seem to have behavior even though there is no real steering force. Or Tim O'Reilly suggested in an article that some of the layer 10 organizations like Wall Street or even more the, the whole system Wall Street dominated capitalism might be an analog super intelligence. It's nice, it's good reads and nice to think about. 
I haven't made up my mind yet. The problem is that on these layers, there's always people involved that make decisions. And uh, I've got some people here, there some pictures of persons that are from Germany and that are involved or have been involved in security theater, uh, security politics, sorry, <laughs> in the last years. Um, the Germans in the room might know most of them, I guess, but there is uh, big discussions about these two at the moment. The, the one on the right is the head of the interior uh, secret service called Verfassungsschutz. The one on the left is one of the heads of our right-wing con or conservative parties. And uh, so these nice gentlemen have been, so the, the, one, the three on the left have been in charge in Germany of, of security, IT security and security politics. And uh, this person is the head of the uh, police union and this person this, um, and this person and this person have to stand um, accusations of being too close to right wing parties at the moment so these other persons on layer 10 that want you and us in Germany to trust them so they are some of the the players in this game and uh, the problem there is, and I w we will see that later, is um, all too often it's just about tools and <sighs> tools that don't really match the requirements of security. And it's like this guy here, he's just yelling for the same tools to fix all problems. Duct tape, um, zip ties and gloves, and you can fix everything. That's like Hornbach IT. You know Hornbach? Do you have that in Czech Republic? The Yes? Hornbach IT, there's always something to fix. <laughs> so, huh? <laughs> yes. So, we have in this security theater, let's go back to this meme of the theater. We have actors, we have intentions of the actors. And we saw politicians here, and what is their intention? They want to be re-elected. The corporations, companies, they want, to, they want to have or make more money, of course. The managers, I want you, the manager says, I want you um, to do what I need for my boss, career, or my money. Then we have the user at the, at the computer. He says, I don't want to change, or usually, it's a, okay, it's a meme, it's a generalization, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to change, he doesn't want no stress, he doesn't want to learn, he just want to, wants to do his work and go home in the evening and have a beer, and he wants simple solutions that integrate with his habits, and we've lost him already in the course of this sentence, I guess. Yeah? So they don't want explanations, they want simple and understandable things. And then, then there's us. <laughs> and then there's us, and we are, we are the ones who have to bring all the other things together on this stage. And have you tried turning it off and on again? It's just... <sighs> we are caught in the triangle of secure, fast, or usable, or secure, fast, and cheap. That's, that's, that's just normal for us in IT security. And uh, that's also why often these people come up with the classical plots. Classical plots, I try to explain them with other memes or quotes from books. There's always someone who will try to sell you some strange kind of sausage. All the Terry Pratchett readers will know what I mean. Whenever two or three Pratchett said, whenever two or three people gather, a fourth one will come and try to sell them a sauce, kind of sausage roll. <laughs> Um, then there's those people who say, we can help you, this is the perfect snake oil for you. Yes, this is wonderful, it will help you. Antivirus, great, your Linux, don't worry, Linux, antivirus, yeah. Then we have the people that say, give us all your data and you will never have to worry again. Then there are the people who say, we need more control because everybody wants job, whatever, security. And then there's those people that say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. And now look again at these people. Would you, do, would you trust them? I prefer Sledgehammer. <laughs> Sledgehammer? Somebody knows that? If you don't know it, look it up at YouTube. It's really crazy TV series from the, from the 80s. And the meme, the classical plot is also, if you stick with us, you're safe. We know what we're doing, so stick with us. As I said before, problem is, if the security theater is uncovered, the trust is destroyed, but customers will need to buy new products. They have to buy new products. So 
shoot the messenger before he tells anybody is a really convenient way. It's uh, one of the wonderful management anti patterns. I have some of them in my other talk. But um, you, you understand you can't lose if you're in security. If you're selling stuff in security, you, you can't really lose without all of that. And uh, here we are also with the management anti patterns. We have some masks and disguises or costumes of of people appearing on the stage. We have the management and its anti-patterns, for example. Do anybody knows what Yamfi is? Yet another meeting will fix it. Don't you, don't, you have a security hole? Let's make a meeting. Then we have conference bingo and other things. We have consultants. Uh, that's sort of the anthropomorphic personification of blameware. Yeah, you, you call them in and they take the blame and then I, I did that as a consultant. That was really amazing. That was my first, yeah, real, uh, that was the first time that I got money for just sitting in a meeting and saying, yes, they are right. <laughs> and uh, good, then we've got coders. Uh, do you know what onion code is? Onion code is when you make wrappers around wrappers around wrappers around wrapper, wrappers, yeah? because you don't understand the error message. So code throws out an error message, nobody understands it. What do you do? You make a wrapper around it so that the error message doesn't stop the code, so that the, the program's still running. Yeah? And when that happens more often, then you get onion code, several shells around it. And nerds will also say, well, you can't be totally self, so why bother at all? Yeah, and the uh, quotes from the IT crowd. And the fool and the art of complaining is also a meme uh, on stage. That's sentences you will hear from users on a variety of levels, and it's, it also includes DevOps. Yeah, DevOps is the container mantra of, hey, it works on my system. I don't understand your problem. And uh, yeah, for the Americans, Europeans socialize through complaining, but that's a different story. <laughs> I have, I forgot my clock, so you have to tell me about the time. Um, this is now the part with the examples, or the painful part. I can go through fast or slow, depending on the time. And uh, Why is the, all of this so complex? It's because we have cognitive bias. And uh, this... Ah, cool. Dankeschön. Yeah, super. So this, this wonderful graphics is... Every entry in this graphic is one cognitive bias that we have in our brain. So that's assumptions that we have like engraved in our biology from evolution, from biology, from genetics, from whatever. We have a lot of bias which makes us believe in things. We want to believe in things. We want to believe everything is safe. <laughs> and thus our, our biology betrays us. And uh, it's, uh, there's a cognitive bias codex. I'll have some examples for that. It all is rooted in the fact that we are tribal and it's ev in evolution. Um, we are, I, I take this now, we are, we are terrible at assessing dangers because um, in, in the past, that maybe there were two kinds of people walking through the forest. They, they both saw something stretched out, brown, on the floor. One of them would go, oh, and a nice walking stick and takes it, and he gets bitten by a, by, a, uh, by, a, by a venomous snake and dies. And the other one, he walks the forest and sees something like long brown and says, ah, that might be a snake, I won't touch it. So which one of the two will be dominant, which, which attitude will be dominant through evolution? And that is why we overestimate negative experiences that is why we over-exaggerate um, dangers and why we cannot, so we are, we are coined by evolution, we are driven to wrongly assess dangers. We think they, the, more, the more lively we can imagine a danger, the more realistic it is to happen, which is plainly wrong. That's why plane crashes are so much more of a threat or fear for many people instead of car crashes. Car crashes happen every day, kill a lot of people. Plane crashes don't happen very often, but everybody can imagine them very lively and big and colorful. Yeah. 
And despite the fact the most dangerous things at airports are somewhere completely different. <laughs> but we just don't, we wouldn't believe that, or we wouldn't. I mean, if you think about that, it's clear, yes. So the most dangerous things at an airport are the trays where we put in our wallet and our laptop and everything, because they are really, really dirty and they obviously never get cleaned. So this, the, the security check-in is the most dangerous place, yes? Just stick there. <laughs> And there's, these are articles from, from Guardian and whatever. We also underestimate facial recognition technology. It's, uh, it's amazing about what they can predict about ourselves. Or smart TVs, wonderful. They can tell you what, if you have one of these devices, they, can, they, can, they have it in their database, what you watched last year, where you make the pause, and they may have patterns, information about patterns when you go to see the toilet. Things that you don't even know. But smart, uh, smart TVs, they, they recognize, they follow, they do eye, eyeball tracking and all of that stuff. Despite the, all of that, we are afraid of terrorism. And if you understand German, I really suggest you should watch this. It's on Heute Show, it's a German TV, political comedy show. Uh, Nico Semsrott is a comedian. And this is a 10-minute video about what we are afraid of. And it's really great because um, one sentence from him is, yeah, it's up there. Terror or stairs? What do you think kills more people every year in Germany? So his question is, who's the leader of the ladders? <laughs> who's behind the ladder conspiracy? Yeah? Because thousands of people die from ladders every year, or hundreds, but none died of terrorism last year. So we've got more of that. I know this, is, this will cause discussion later and on the conference all the time. Bicycle helmets. If the story of bicycle helmets is true, pedestrians and housewives should carry helmets all the time. And car drivers and people in cars. These are groups that have a much higher probability to have severe head injuries. Yeah? And they happen much more frequently. And there's lots of arguments, but we, it's much more visible. And there's the wretched system that I'll tell you later of is also happening here. Um, I'll come to that later. Code of conduct, also difficult. In, in this is something for America, when I, when I do this speech in America. Uh, in Europe, we have the law telling people to behave, and, in, and it's limiting freedom of speech a lot. In America, this doesn't happen that much by law. And code of conduct, yeah. I fail to believe that we reach the people that we want to reach with that. But it's, it's memes and we think they help. We feel better if we have that. We feel better with a bicycle helmet on. We feel better with a code of conduct. And then there is the war on drugs. Yeah, everybody understands, yeah, that's horrible, we have to fight that. But then there's countries like Portugal that shows uh, that they have found much more efficient ways against that. Lie detectors, polygraphs, for how many years have they been in use? And I think they're still in use in the US, even though they are scientifically proven to be wrong. And they are the role model for so-called pseudoscience. Video surveillance, if video surveillance helps, why then have the most significant terror attacks in Europe happened in places where there was the most of the video surveillance, namely London? Hmm. We can discuss every single item here, but they are just standard memes. This is Peter Schar. He, was, he used to be the chief data officer of the Republic of Germany. I, I met him once, I was on stage with him, and he's written a really, really great article about why video surveillance is actually counterintuitive counter against security. And uh, some other examples, okay, this is more like a fun thing about two-factor authentication. Maybe you remember last year, uh, Apple introduced two-factor authentication, you needed a username and a password, but that's just some fun. But two-factor authentication is a problem. I wrote this article in 2012, uh, why um, a smartphone is not really a second factor. 
but still we want to believe yeah we still want to believe that it increases the security but it doesn't your smartphone is in the same wi-fi as your laptop or your computer and so it as a one of the sources that i had for this article a hacker or computer programmer pen tester he said it modern smartphones are so powerful it doesn't matter anymore if the smartphone hacks your windows computer or your computer hacks the smartphone while while they're in the same wi-fi yeah and banks told us then there was consors a big investment capital bank they told us we know it's insecure mobile town we know it's insecure but we still keep on recommending it until it's actively exploited wonderful so or wolfgang schäuble our f uh, former german minister of interiors he said everybody can have my fingerprint and we love the fingerprint and passports and, uh, and stuff so the chaos computer club said okay here it is here it is and at Linux magazine, we printed it on cups, so I have some coffee mugs at home with his fingerprint on it. But the really cool thing is the stamp. So the internet, you can't hide it. So the internet created a stamp with Schäuble, the minister's fingerprint on that. So you just need the right liquid, oil, fat, whatever, and you can use it for stupid fingerprint readers to unlock. Hackers are, yes. <laughs> Just some examples coming up now. This, and that's really, yeah. They take over your Sonos devices, talk to, and then they talk to Alexa, and they make you play Rick Astley. I think this is really mean. Um, if you've seen uh, South Park, the last season, the first episode was really great because they messed around with your Alexa, Google, whatever boxes. People use Twitter for their for critical infrastructure stuff because they want to believe it's safe, but it's no. Um, while at the same time our governments are hacking into mobile networks and mobile phones, and uh, we have we are using or many people even in sec secure areas like the military, they are using technologies that reveal a lot of information, they just don't know because they are not aware of it. Um, I've got some friends who, have, who happen to be in the German military and they've been in Afghanistan. And uh, this is, I think, Kundos, if I remember right. And this is, a, but this is an American Air Force base in Kundos and it is secret. You see it in, in Google Maps, it's blanked out, so you don't see the, in, the details. Yeah? But up there, this is data collected by Fitbits. And the soldiers are prone to do a lot of training, yeah? and they're using the smartwatches. Yeah? And so they could do a map of the interior of the secret Air Force base. IoT is a wonderful topic. This guy is collecting, at that time he has 108,682 ships in his list. Um, commercial vessels have internet uplinks through satellite. He found out that the routers on these ships are bad, con badly configured with a standard password. And in the satellite network, they, they, they are visible to each other. So he wrote a little Perl or Python script, and so he hijacked one ship after the other. Then he automated that, and that is how he got control over 108,000 ships, or not the ships, but the routers on the ship. If you think that's only the Wi-Fi of the ship, no, it's not. These routers also have GPS. <laughs> So he could fake the GPS position of the ships. And when you're in a harbor like New York or in LA or, where, what, or San Francisco, 50 meters may make a difference, and when you're, especially when you've got chemicals on board. And he even found, uh, somewhere in Kansas, he found a gas station that reported its temperature data of the tanks to a server. And... Uh, that you can assume that there is both heating and cooling going on because Kansas can get very hot and very cold. So if you report a very low temperature in the high in a high of uh, heat of summer, maybe the gas station might blow up. So that's just to show what people are doing with IoT. And if you think antivirus software helps, no, sorry, this is data from 2008. But uh, antivirus software often is the gateway where. Uh, problems come in, and even the 
German authorities tell you that, tell us that 40% so antivirus software doesn't catch 40% of the attacks. As, and he said that in the investigations to the German Parliament hack last year. And it even you're even extending you 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 are make you you are you pre, you are a bigger goal or not a bigger goal. Um, the attack surface is bigger when you're using uh, antivirus software. I know some people who no, do not use PDF engines, but the antivirus software brings in a PDF engine, so then they are uh, attackable again through PDF viruses because it's in the AV stuff. And uh, okay, let's not talk about bad solutions from big companies. Um, German politics, at least, tends to you to order stuff from companies that have the reputation of being too big to not fail. And you may have heard about the safe and encrypted uh, official German mail system, the email gone again because it just wasn't safe and the special mail system for lawyers in Germany with end-to-end -end encryption and it was they published the, they published the, the public keys not uh, they published the private keys not the public keys <laughs> that was the end of it too and it was always it's always the same company it was always Atos in these cases and uh, last e example I've got this book in the back it's a book for children and management SCADA anybody knows SCADA S-C-A-D-E S-C-A-D-A it's the control system architecture running our power plants nuclear power plants we're not far from Temelin I think and I think they also run that and it's um, it's this are, these are pictures from the book and I can it's really it's a great book for children explaining the problem uh, with the industry in this case, that a lot of effort is focused on warding off big attention-grabbing attacks, but they, they, they never take on the, the, the details, that they never take on the real problems. And Stuxnet in Iran was based on SCADA. You remember Stuxnet when they, when uh, um, probably American Israeli software uh, at blew up nuclear facilities, not power plants, but facilities, centrifuges. And the uh, problem is, SCADA is unencrypted and there's machines connected to the internet through unencrypted channels that were never built to be connected through any kind of network. So there is basic things to be done and they are not done because uh, management often focuses on the, the big PR topics. So, But a lot of people who go on about cyber war just want job security and big contracts. Here we are again on OZ Layer 10. Yeah? Yeah, these two, this, this is just two articles that I wrote, and these are, yeah. The fact that Microfocus focus, uh, forces us to change our passwords every three months basically made me write, made me, gave me inspiration for this article and for this presentation. Um, Password reuse is the most dangerous thing, and every password that you, can, that you can remember is an unsafe password. It's as easy as that. The only two things matter, length and entropy. The darknet, if you think you're, um, that's another nice meme that politics and OZ layer 9 and 10 often tell you it's uh, so, such a dangerous and yeah, wild place, but it's human error and social hacking that uh, de-anonymizes you very fast. And even the, the darknet people themselves, they say that f after five minutes, a server can identify you because then you've left enough traces in your browser uh, that, that uh, can tell about your behavior and your uh, personality and who you are. So, yeah, we had meltdown. That's just... Is that still true? <laughs> Um, another common thing at these days is crypto checking. So the website is starting a flash or whatever plugin in your browser and is using your machine for mining Bitcoin or whatever in the background. And of course, harvesting credit card numbers and passwords from your site. There's 
Uh, and two more examples that are coming up. That's one problem that we have is ridiculously complex algorithms. Uh, it was it's a, it's a bit it was already something years ago when I talked to to developers from Google and then they already told me that's ten years ago I think they or, or eight years yeah they already told me that they don't understand really they cannot understand anymore what their software is doing if they want to if they had to implement a law like the right to forget they said yeah it's like we are turning some some dials yeah and we we look at the outcome. And we're turning the dials until the outcome is correct. But what's happening in between is pretty cloudy. And uh, that's a great article about the same topic, about uh, how our algorithms have changed. And I don't know, you may be affected in the same way. You, uh, when in, 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 in former times we had constants and pointers and whatever, now we, have, we are dealing with the input from another algorithm that we are using in an algorithm and piping into the next algorithm. And that, at an extent, that gets very, very complex. And that's the article, God is in the machine. It's really nice reading. And one big problem that we have is in, in, in on this science security theater is that we, we don't fix many of the problems that we have. As I said before, many things are just superficially fixed, but not really because only stuff is fixed that gets media attention, but the underlying things aren't fixed. So, uh, some, some, it's also a very nice article I can recommend. The Tay Bridge collapsed in the 80, 1879, and there was a huge investigation, and it changed the way bridges are built, are being built forever. But that was classical engineering, not software engineering. <laughs> Yeah, because we tend to, and and we tend to, to just patch things. It's even the word patch it. Yeah, but it there's no um, forward-looking general concept in fixing things. No fundamental way of changing things. And if you think, okay, that was an. Uh, I mean, I don't have to tell that to you, but that that cost sixty death, 60 casualties, also IT, it's since, not only since the 80s, but there was an, was an X-ray machine that killed people, we don't know how many people worldwide, because it was a long radiation enforced death, so they, they had a long suffering, and it's not easy to, to, to find out what, what caused their suffering uh, with radiation, and, but the, they found out that the Terak 25 was an X-ray machine that and, and the race condition in the software caused the X-ray machine to, to really poison the people with radiation. But the vendor was so smug that he said, oh no, not in our software. <laughs> Can't happen here. Yeah? And that is... I've seen that several times, not, not only since then, but that is one example where it is definitely proven that it killed people. And that's things that we have to think about, I think. We don't... When it comes to security, we don't... We, we, we f often fail to um, to go to the to the really to the fundamentals, and uh, that is also why I I have this. This so I'm getting closer to the end soon. Um, that's also why I I um, want to give a statement or a call against responsible responsible disclosure. Do you all know what responsible disclosure is? If you find a flaw in a software or a backdoor or a, a mistake, um, tell the vendor, keep it back, don't publish it yet, and wait until he has fixed it, and then go public with it. But um, I, I've talked to many people and I don't think that is a viable way anymore. Um, it's by the fact, by, fact, by the way, it's an old debate. It's a debate that comes from the 19th century, lock picking. Um, the rudimentary treatise on construction of locks from Alfred Hobbes, famous locksmith of his time, he already said in 1850 in his book, it is to the interest of honest persons to know about insecurities because the dishonest are tolerably certain to be the first to apply the knowledge practically. And today we are discussing whether we should disclose a security hole in something. I know it's a, dis I know it's a discussion, but... This slide is, I mean, nothing new for you, I guess. But 
if you disclose it, you can literally push this back here. And this is the time where customers and people are at risk. And Bruce Schneier is on the same side. And he goes even farther because we've here, here again the other OZ layers come in. The problem is that our governments want to use uh, zero day exploits. Zero day exploits are, as you know, probably here this red part. So, because they are unfixed, they are not publicly known. So, our secret services, our states want to buy them so that they can use them to hack into the computers of criminals. But that causes so many negative effects also on society. And there is a great article by Bruce Schneier on the topic of government hacking. So what can we do? I say doing nothing is not an option. If you have a look at the internet today, you see what happens when we do nothing. I don't believe in the, in the invisible hand there anymore because when we've, been, we've not been doing anything and what do we have? We have four companies that govern the internet and they have sort of a monopoly, each one of them. It's Facebook, Apple, Google, and uh, Amazon. And uh, so I think we need to do things and one of the things that I like to, dis like to discuss is we need liability for software mistakes and such embedded in hardware. I mean, Dieselgate is one of these topics, so where's the liability? <laughs> Will they get away with it? You could also discuss if Spectre and the other stuff, if that is, has, what, what, that has caused um, damage. You can discuss it. But we need the societies and hence lawmakers to define rules about that. And I do think that open source still has to play a bigger role in that. Um, it's no, as I said before, it's no guarantee for security, but there's no security without it. So what I ask for is public money, public code. If m public money, if tax money is spent then the co in development of code, then the code should be free and available. That's so old, but it's still true. Um, I'm asking, should we introduce software liability and exempt open source from it? Is that even possible, legally? Then, make open source mandatory for certified secure infrastructure and environments. Certify users, hardware, and software. What? That's complicated. Is that too much? We have one system oops, where that already exists, and that is the Data highway, the tra that is the real traffic. We have that. We have certified cars. The cars are tested every year or every other year. Drivers have to do a test, and when they get old, they have, sometimes in some countries they have to redo their tests. And we have liability for drivers, owners, and manufacturers. And there's off-the-grid fun parks, racing parks, and whatever, where people can try and test uh, uncertified things. It is also, at the same time, guaranteed auto anonymous, which is also under, under severe attack. So you're, basically, you're not anonymous anymore when you're in your car, because you've got a number plate. But it's still, in, at least in Germany, it's not allowed to collect this data and use it. The problem in security politics is we have this ratchet system that I said before, and I'm almost done now. The ratchet system is we are turning the dial in one direction always, and you cannot turn it back. Yeah? It's like a zip lock. It's, it just goes one way, it goes tighter, 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 tighter. And that is something that we have in security politics almost everywhere. And that is why I call for another move, that is sunset clauses. We should have sunset clauses. A sunset clause is a, terms for, a term from politics that means we, we make a new law, and the new law is uh, valid until a certain time in the future, like until sunset. Yeah? And then it has to be re-evaluated. But that alone wouldn't help much because we need 
sunset clauses with goals and reviews and mechanisms that need to be defined with, with, the, the, with the law or with any kind of mechanism or anything, any measure any, that is taken for security, I think should have clear goals and mechanisms for review in a company. So if you introduce something for the goal of increasing security, there should be, at the start, there should be clear rules how do we measure success. And if there is no success, skip it. So I think we need that in every security-related law, order or decision. And I think these sunset clauses should be mandatory if they're security related. We can discuss that. And this is my last slide. Until then, common sense is no witchcraft. So there's some questions here for security. I think this is also pretty obvious to this audience. So one of the most important questions if you're talking about security, your personal security is against whom do you want to protect? There is literally no sense protecting your family against, or trying to protect your family against the secret service. Because you need a secret service to protect against them. But you may be able to protect against others, against other attacks. I'm almost done. And remember the Pareto rule, that's a rule from project management. 80% is fair enough. Managers and politicians, they should do their homework, they should create goals, reviews, and checks, and enforce them. But you, I think this is a nice wish. Usually they will keep on uh, making decisions based on PR results and based on what makes them re-elected. But the users, back on OZ Layer 8, they, we have to address them, we have to tell them, and every one of you is a user. We have to be aware that it is necessary that we keep on learning all the time. And learning is done through mistakes. I mean, at SUSE, this is also pretty obvious because we have a great culture of mistakes where we sort of honor them or where we embrace them and say, okay, that's not what we wanted, but now we know that this is not the right way. And open source is mandatory for security. There's no security without. Always remember, not all politicians are stupid or ignorant of open source software. Some really know and actively act against it. And that is something that I learned in Brussels from politicians from the European Parliament. So, you are silent and you didn't interrupt me. What are your experiences? What do you think of? The theater. <laughs> Any questions? Thorsten, where's the ball? I have to make a correction about the suitcases. It is really hard to buy a suitcase without a TSA lock these days. Yes. So it's probably the effect is that we we do this for now. We've settled on this, so we just keep on doing this, doing it because nobody else complains. So business as usual, keep doing what you what you've been doing. So yes, that's that's such a perfect example of cargo cult science. Cargo cult science came up in the in the, in the Second World War when some. South Sea to Islanders, uh, some 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 tropical, yeah, island people. Yeah, they started to build altars for the airplanes because the airplanes occasionally dropped stuff on the island. Yeah, and they started to think that praying to the airplane gods would make the airplane gods send them uh, goods. <laughs> There's some, some neat pictures in Wikipedia if you look at for, for cargo cult. Yeah, and that's just we just keep on doing it, and we and that's yeah. Perfect example where security measure goes shoots go, backfires. No more questions. So thank you.